Okay, um, welcome back everybody. Um, welcome to this session uh, which is looking at the, how we can demonstrate the value um, of hospice care to, to commissioners. Um, one of the things that really strikes me and has struck me actually over the last, over the last couple of days is that too often I think we think about commissioning as being about process. Um, but in reality, commissioning is about, or should be about, relationships. Um, and how we can build those new relationships, new partnerships between our, our, our hospice community and our NHS partners um, in, in the form of commissioners. So it's a, to me, commissioning is actually more about partnership and relationship than it is about transaction and activity. What we've got um, are three fantastic speakers who are hopefully going to continue the rebellious theme of this, of this conference and, and give us some really good food for thought on, on some of the work that they've been doing locally to, to really push the boundaries and reposition hospice care um, in a very new way and build those new relationships with, um, with their commissioners. So you're going to hear a lot about the what, the why, and the how, um, and hopefully at the end of all of that, you will have lots of questions about the what, the why, and the how to, to fire back this way. So we're going to make sure that there's plenty of time for, for your reflections and, and your comments. Um, let me introduce our, our three speakers all together, and then we'll, we'll, we'll get started on their, on their introductory remarks. Um, on my Far left, we have Mark Jarman Howe, who's Chief Executive at St Helena Hospice, um, also the East of England representative on the Hospice UK Advisory Council. Um, Mark has a, um, a, a background working in the NHS in a variety of, of um, operational commissioning and management roles. Um, and next, we have uh, Lucy Nixon, who's Chief Executive at Ashgate Hospice, also with a background in, in, in the NHS, in healthcare, um, um, starting her career as an oncology nurse um, um, as, and moving on as a health visitor, um, moving on ultimately uh, to be Head of Performance at the East Midlands Strategic Health Authority. Should also point out that today is Lucy's birthday. Um, so, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> many, many happy returns, Lucy. Um, and finally, Kate Lee, who's Chief Executive of the Mighton Hospice Group, um, working across Coventry and Warwickshire. Um, Kate has um, a very interesting and very un a very unusual, I think, background um, um, within, the, within the hospice movement. She was formerly Director of Strategy at the British Red Cross, um, covering both strategy and UK operations. Um, so a very interesting uh, position there too. Um, so let's kick off. Um, Mark, I think you're, you're, you're going first, and then we'll just move through the presentations and move to questions at the end of the session. Well, good afternoon. Um, I think Helen Bevan's presentation yesterday resonated with a lot of people, and as Jonathan alluded to in his sort of introduction, uh, I think this presentation, the theme of it, really is trying to rein in my natural instinct to be a troublemaker um, and try and bring out the more positive, constructive uh, rebel side to manage the relationship with commissioners. Um, there are two main parts uh, that I'd like to cover um, in this sort of presentation. Uh, the first is talking about the work that we did as a hospice last financial year. Um, to persuade our local clinical commissioning group uh, to enter into a unique joint commissioning arrangement with us. Uh, and then the second part is I'd like to talk about the consequences of getting what we wish for uh, and the reality of being a commissioner um, uh, from a hospice perspective. So not just a lead provider, but actually starting to think uh, like a commissioner in the way that we try and drive standards around um, quality of care uh, and sort of integration of care across our locality. Um, I suppose the starting point, though, is to sort of say, um, you know, why um, position yourself as wanting to be in a uh, sort of uh, lead commissioner, a sort of uh, joint commissioning type arrangement. Uh, and I think there were sort of two main aspects to that. Um, one was a bit of a sort of a burning platform uh, type issue, uh, and the other was much more about sort of the best way to achieve our, our sort of broader social mission. Um, so the first was that we um, had had a very clear ind uh, indication from our clinical commissioning group uh, that their intention uh, was to go to market uh, with a very big uh, community service tender uh, of which they wanted 
uh, end-of-life care services in the community to be bundled with uh, wider community services. Uh, and that obviously raised a lot of um, concerns for us about what that meant for our position in the local health economy uh, and our ability to actually sort of um, achieve the agenda uh, that was important to us. Uh, so we were very motivated about sort of trying to find alternative uh, ways forward around that. And I know a lot of colleagues uh, around the country have been in the position where you're having to uh, negotiate with lots of other uh, providers from different sectors and, and sort of position yourself as part of a consortium to bid to win for funding which currently is already um, yours. Um, but the other sort of important bit was that there was very much um, a sort of a mission focus to this. Uh, and when I came into post I had um, really positive discussions with my board of trustees uh, and we came to a very clear uh, sort of view that what we wanted um, our strategy uh, and our sense of purpose to be about was about the population as a whole uh, within the geography that we serve. So we wanted to make sure that we were reaching out to meet all of the palliative and end of life care needs uh, within our locality, not just to be focused on providing a niche service for those lucky enough to be referred to us. Uh, and from that, it really got us thinking about, well, how do we influence other providers of palliative and end-of-life care, as well as um, seeking to continuously improve our own services. So if I come back to the sort of the first um, motivator, um, knowing that um, our clinical commissioning group um, were looking at uh, these different options for how they wanted services to be provided in the future, there are only three, really three um, commissioning routes um, available to them. Um, however creative um, the end agreement or contract you come up with, um, it's got to be one of these uh, three mechanisms that they've got to use to get to that agreement. Uh, and we felt very strongly that we were in a position uh, to uniquely sell our benefits, that a single tender action was the appropriate way to then get into a wider discussion about the joint commissioning. Um, so to approach that, what we wanted to do was we needed to get their attention uh, and we needed to start that discussion. So the first thing we did was give notice uh, on our current agreement, uh, and we did that by using the clauses within that contract to say, actually, this is no longer fit for purpose. Uh, it doesn't reflect fairly uh, the contribution that we're making within the local health system. Uh, it doesn't help us look prospectively to how we meet the growing demand uh, within our area. Uh, and also, I don't think it reflects the contribution that we make um, locally as a uh, driver of standards, provider of education, etc. So what we thought about was, um, having got their attention and having started that discussion, how could we then help them uh, to come to that conclusion that the best procurement op option was to work with us uh, as the best lead provider for um, end-of-life care? So our starting point was the Social Value Act. Um, I was very much influenced by um, Kate's presentation at conference last year uh, about the Social Value Act and quite merrily nicked uh, a lot of the very positive ideas that she'd uh, managed to learn from her experiences at sort of Myton hospices. Uh, and we really sort of talked about the fact that we were uniquely positioned to offer a number of community, economic and social benefits as a provider of palliative and end-of-life care that no one else could. Um, we also made a point of doing some of the work on the Commissioner's behalf and I think a top tip is um, if you want to manage the relationship with commissioners and get in their good books, don't be afraid to do some of the research and the work for them. Uh, they tend to respond extremely favourably to that. Um, so one of the things we did was we made sure that we really looked into uh, the current commissioning guidance uh, and we made sure that we helped guide them through the fact that there was a legitimate route to come into a conclusion that a single tender action was the best way forward. Um, and I've used an example here of sort of one of the key uh, procurement guidelines from the Department of Health that, that helped us with that discussion. Um, we also took that a step or two further. So we actually thought about what steps and processes do they need to go through to get their board uh, to sign off the proposal where we were working up with them. Um, so we did the market analysis for them to demonstrate that there weren't any current or likely to be any new providers within the local market that could offer uh, the range of um, benefits that we could. We also helped them by modelling the financials, uh, and I'll come back to it in a moment. We even went as far as doing the HRG level analysis for them to help them uh, identify where they would take the savings out of the acute uh, contract. Um, and we also made a significant contribution, um, i.e. wrote most of, um, the tender waiver paper and the board paper that they eventually took to the board. So it was a very collaborative, engaged process from the start, but very much with us taking the initiative within that. 
We also wanted to sort of stress the fact that this wasn't just about technicalities, um, it wasn't just about trying to protect our position. Um, what we wanted to do was we wanted to secure a role within the local health economy where we could maximise the benefit for local patients and families. So the other key thing that we did in parallel to these more technical discussions um, was we um, worked with them to introduce a significant new service. Uh, and we offered to pump prime that using our hospice reserves as a way of, one, securing control of that really important um, sort of building block for a comprehensive palliative and end-of-life care service in our area, but also to demonstrate the fact that we were willing to take a level of risk and to engage with them in a way that no other provider in our local health system would be willing to. So Single Point is our 24-7 palliative care coordination centre. Um, we manage the local end-of-life care register. Um, we manage referrals into district nursing, into uh, GP services and out of hours locally, and we also have our own 24-7 uh, rapid response service within that, as well as a range of hospice at home um, services that are part of that. And now, that was absolutely key to us demonstrating um, that we were engaged, that we bought into the national strategy, that we recognised what needed to be done to deliver integrated uh, and coordinated care for people in our area. And I think it made the point that we weren't just protecting our position, we wanted to work with them to improve services locally. Um, we also did some fairly unsubtle work in terms of just reminding them of our unique benefits. Um, not least the fact that actually if they didn't go down the right procurement route they put at risk some of those benefits and that they shouldn't take for granted uh, the fact that we put £3 million a year of investment into high quality palliative and end of life care locally um, which we could always take uh, our toys away from them and just do our own thing in terms of how we prioritised and used that funding but what we said to them instead was actually let's look at this as us pooling our resources and our investment and maximising the impact that we can have together. Um, we were able to present that quite attractive to them because we, like most hospices, or, or sorry, like the average hospice, um, get about a third of our funding um, from the local NHS. So it's sort of fairly straightforward to say that there's no other provider that for every pound uh, they get in, they're getting an extra £2.50 uh, benefit back in terms of that investment within the economy. We were also able to talk about some of the uh, sort of intangible benefits, not least our goodwill, uh, and I'm in North uh, East Essex, uh, where we have Colchester Hospital, um, and where clearly um, sort of brand, confidence, uh, goodwill around providers uh, within the economy are at a premium, uh, and we uniquely have the strongest brand um, locally, but also the, the benefits of the volunteer mobilisation that we have. So at the time at which we were discussing with them, we had just over a 1,000 volunteers, which we'd worked out was the equivalent to additional £1.3 million benefit into the local area, as well as all the spin-off benefits you get from uh, volunteers as well. And as I say, you know, we were also able to present ourselves as a very much a need-driven, autonomous organisation, able and willing to take risks uh, that other providers just simply weren't able to. So the financial benefits, I won't go into too much detail, but I think the key thing was that we worked with them to get access to the acute data because um, any business case around sort of investing in community services basically boils down to uh, shifting resource out of the acute setting into the community. Now, the best way to do that is to help the commissioner to identify exactly which HRGs um, they're going to take in terms of their activity plan negotiations for the coming year. So we're getting hold of that data. We were then able to do that analysis for them. Um, we were able to work out the average cost of an a and &E attendance. We worked out that two-thirds of um, non-elective end-of-life admissions were via a and &E. So as well as the um, average saving of uh, that spell by avoiding the admission in the first place, we were also able to calculate uh, the uh, benefits in terms of A&E um, spend reduction. And we also looked at excess bed days uh, and were able to identify the trim points for the HRGs that we were targeting. So we were able to present a very comprehensive picture to say, if you put significant additional um, investment in, we will also put significant additional investment in, and we will work with you with some KPIs that will actually tangibly allow you to deliver uh, your activity targets around the acute sector as well. There are obviously some significant non-financial benefits to the arrangement as well, so shifting activity 
um, that's appropriate from the acute into the community setting is really helpful in terms of um, mortality rates. Um, uh, unfortunately, our uh, local hospital was one of the ones that was picked up uh, through the KEO review process. So um, our shimmy indicator was uh, out of line with um, the national uh, expected level. Um, and a lot of that reason was because of high numbers of inappropriate end of life um, admissions. Um, so what we were able to demonstrate was that actually avoiding the admission takes them out of that indicator in the first place, but also by um, those where they, you know, you can't avoid the admission, but you can discharge them back out into the community sooner, we worked out that actually reducing length of stay also took people out of the 30-day post-discharge, because a lot of end-of-life admissions that uh, ended terminally in the acute setting actually were staying for longer than 30 days. So there were some really significant benefits that were hitting significant indicators for the local economy, um, as well as all of the qualitative benefits. Uh, and a key thing for us as an organisation was that we really wanted to focus on patient choice, preferred place of care, preferred place of death. Uh, and we really felt that our interests in terms of supporting what patients tell us um, they want really aligned very well with that agenda around QIP and managing acute demand. So suffice to say, we were successful in persuading them to go for the single tender action. Um, and we, um, along with that um, uh, sort of grant agreement that we negotiated um, off the back of that, we were also entered into a memorandum of agreement um, with them um, to spell out uh, what our joint commissioning uh, relationship would look like. So it's a slightly unusual relationship because what we've done is we've persuaded them to turn back the clock and to blur the provider purchaser split because actually, in terms of delivering integrated health care, I think end-of-life and palliative care is a great example of where it's entirely appropriate uh, to blur that distinction. Um, and what we were able to say was that we can both be the lead provider of end-of-life care, so we would provide a significant amount of that activity directly ourselves. We would also subcontract with some other providers of um, end-of-life and palliative care to deliver the overall bundle. But in addition to that, we would also be involved in jointly setting and agreeing the commissioning intentions and the commissioning priorities within our locality. And we would not only be setting KPIs in a mutually agreed way between ourselves and the commissioner, we also have been involved in setting the KPIs for the acute hospital and for the community providers as well. So we've been able to influence uh, that delivery of care and that standard uh, and expectation of care right the way across the health system. A uh, key point bearing in mind the discussions at the moment around the introduction of uh, a national currency and some of the concerns we've got about the potentially overly narrow scope around that is that we were very successful in broadening the scope of our agreement with the CCG. So as you can see, not only did we have specialist palliative care, we were also able to extend it to general palliative care. So anybody on the end of life register, anybody in the last year of life that was identified, by definition, definition they fell into the scope uh, of our area of interest, but also bereavement, psychosocial, spiritual support, all of which, which is excluded from the currency at the moment, we've managed to get that within scope, as well as education and research. So all of our non-income generating costs, we are now getting a contribution from the CCG towards. So I'd now like to sort of move on just sort of for a few minutes just to sort of talk about the, um, uh, what that means in reality, now that we've got that um, scope of agreement in place. So the first thing is that we've been um, developing a commissioning relationship, uh, contract management relationship, uh, if you like, uh, with other providers um, in our local area, uh, particularly um, a local hospice, the Jays Hospice and Marie Curie Cancer Care, who provide a night nursing service within our, within our area. Uh, we had long established collaborative working relationships with both those organisations, so we were actually able to persuade them um, before we went to the CCG that they supported our proposal that we wanted to be lead provider and joint commissioner. They could see the benefits of working with us as a sympathetic commissioner that understood their challenges and issues. So what we were able to do was get their buy-in up front, which again helped persuade commissioners that we were a credible proposition. Again, we've used memorandums of agreement as a way of aligning our strategic priorities and our intent. Uh, and that's been particularly key, I think, with um, sort of Marie Curie um, locally, where we've had some very positive, constructive discussions where there is a potential for um, a slight overlap of interests and, and ten tensions. We've actually been able to have an open discussion and say, this is what we want to achieve together in North East Essex. Um, 
a key thing we've done is pass on the benefits from our agreement. So we've moved from rolling year-on-year -year arrangements to a three-year agreement now, which gives us a bit more stability. So the first thing we did was extend their agreements to three years. We've also looked to pay them up front and to be more flexible where that's possible. Uh, and we're working with them in a very joined up way to review their services and to put in place the KPIs uh, and the monitoring that we need, recognising that um, they've needed some support and help uh, and it's been a bit of a joint learning curve in terms of putting those processes in place. So we've been able to have a very different, much more, I think, mature um, relationship between lead provider and subcontractor, where really, actually, what we're trying to do is align our interests and be equal partners in the way that we uh, enter into the spirit of that agreement. Uh, and the key thing for me is minimal bureaucracy, maximum focus on outcomes. So we can avoid a lot of the bureaucracy and the, the unnecessary paperwork that um, the CCGs are tied into. Um, key thing that we've entered into, which I think is, is quite a risky proposition, as far as I'm aware, we're the only hospice in the country doing this at the moment. We now commission direct with GP practices. We pay them a local grant to primary care, which makes a contribution to the administrative costs incurred for them identifying patients at end of life, having advanced care planning discussions with them, and placing them on our uh, local end of life care register, which I know is a slightly potentially contentious area, but from our point of view, it's about the outcomes, it's about the means to the end, and what we're seeing is that this is a significant way of driving engagement with GPs. It's giving us a level of influence and levers that we can pull with primary care that we just never had before as an organisation. Uh, and it gives us a whole different status when we're going and having conversations with them now. Not only do they um, understand us to be the experts locally, they can also now see that there are benefits in working with us in that commissioning relationship um, as well. Um, so the focus of um, that ag grant agreement is really about driving, identifying and getting patients on the register so we can then put proactive care in place for them, but also about getting practices themselves to adopt and embed the gold standard framework uh, principles in the way that they work as well. Uh, and as you can see, we sort of put in place some qualifying criteria that were driving the standards of um, end of life care, which again were helping us deliver the KPIs we'd agreed with the CCG. Um, we've now, bearing in mind we started in June, because there was a bit of a, a time lag getting all of the, the paperwork in place with the CCG. Um, we've now got 37 of the 42 practices locally signed up, which is um, better than the uh, previously been managed when the CCG were doing a precursor arrangement um, to this. Um, and you'll see on the graph, um, there's a, a slightly unusual sort of dip uh, from June to July. Um, that's because um, prior to us putting this arrangement in place, um, we hadn't put in place an effective arrangement for taking deceased patients off of the register. So we were doing quite well in terms of practices, putting them on. Uh, the practices weren't doing quite such a good job of taking them off again. Um, so we were able to agree as part of this arrangement, we took that responsibility for them. So as soon as we were aware uh, that the patient had died, we were able to maintain that. So you can see there's a bit of a data cleansing step from that month, but since we've had this scheme in place, we've then had a steady um, progress in terms of the number of patients on the register, and we're now up to 1,400. And as I say, we're at the stage now where we've reconfigured our community services, and we're starting to roll out a key worker for every single one of those patients on the register, which I think changes the whole dynamic in terms of the, the way we provide care in our area. Finally, I hope I'm doing okay in terms of time, yeah. <laughs> uh, so finally, I just wanted to sort of um, identify some sort of challenges uh, and sort of opportunities that have arisen from positioning ourselves um, in this way. I mean, I think the obvious challenges are that we've set ourselves up to fail, you know, so we've taken a big risk in terms of taking on that additional responsibility. Um, we've consciously raised the expectations of commissioners of us. Um, so whilst we've got a slightly different dynamic and we're more able to influence their agenda than ever before, they do expect us now to deliver. So we've got a challenge as an organisation to think about, do we really have the culture, capacity um, and capability in terms of our skills, our experiences, our infrastructure uh, to actually fully deliver uh, on the opportunity that we've created? And I think the honest answer is at the moment no, and it's very much a work in progress in terms of investing in um, business analytical skills, um, looking at our contract management um, skills, uh, and looking at um, some of those sort of reporting processes and monitoring arrangements that traditionally we hadn't been very good at. So that's a very steep learning curve for us as an organisation. 
Uh, and I think my background in the NHS, and we've recruited one or two people with commissioning experience and stuff to help with that, has been absolutely critical. And I think it's no surprise that um, some relationship with the NHS is actually a big advantage to hospices if you want to effectively manage that relationship with them. Um, I think there are big issues about um, having positioned such a great local agreement. We feel that we're in a brilliant place now to drive forward care in our area. We're now getting ever so nervous about the work on the national currency. So we're, we're absolutely in favour of um, activity capture and standardising the way that we capture activity. We need that evidence base as a sector. But making the leap from that to a funding model is something I'm not at all convinced about. I think there are lots of risks of going down a payment by results route. Um, there's also a challenge in that both um, ourselves and the CCG have put significant additional investment in, um, uh, and I'm talking about a major increase in funding from the CCG, which I think is, is quite unusual from talking to colleagues in other hospices. Um, but despite that success, I'm still nervous that when you look at the, the demographic trends over the next five years, we may still struggle. Um, to actually get anywhere near coping with that increase in demand. So the work that your Hospice UK is doing at the moment about the, the national agenda and positioning hospices as a solution to bigger problems, that's absolutely great and we need to make sure that the funding follows that. Um, but on the opportunity side, I think this, this is a platform to further develop that relationship. So we're now looking at, um, we're positioning ourselves as offering to manage continuing healthcare uh, on behalf, you know, the fast track work on behalf of the local health system. Um, we're trying to open up a discussion at the moment to shift the joint commissioning to not just be with the NHS, we now want to bring social care into that and have a tripartite voluntary sector NHS and social care approach to palliative and end of life care priorities in our area. Uh, and we've got a foothold not just for St Helena Hospice to, to grow and thrive, but actually I see us as um, sort of barging in to create room for other voluntary sector and uh, sort of third sector providers to thrive and grow off the back of the work that we've been doing. And I think we want to see other voluntary sector providers grow in our area as well as ourselves. And finally, I think the key thing for me is that whatever the risks, whatever the additional challenges that come with it, the bottom line is actually we have to be willing to get our hands dirty if we're genuinely committed to reaching out to that unmet need and if we genuinely want to reach out to um, the palliative care demand that we know is going to grow um, enormously in the future. And we have to recognise that we're not going to be able to deliver um, all of that directly ourselves. So any levers that we can pull and we can create for us to influence the quality and the reach of care that's provided, I think we need to take. So thank you. Thank you very much, Mark. I'm sure there's plenty of food for thought there in, and questions that people have got. But let's move straight on now to, to, to Lucy. So you all know it's my birthday, but don't think I'm going to tell you how old I am. So I'll leave it there. Um, I think what I wanted to say, just to start, is that I accept that our experiences will vary in the sector in terms of the relationships that we have with our commissioners. And I think that that's dependent on a number of factors not least whether or not you've got existing relationships with people who actually work within clinical commissioning groups, so whether you're already known to them and them to you, but also the sort of relationship that your organisation has had historically. Um, to some extent um, as well, I think it's relevant how or what experience clinical commissioning groups have had of working with voluntary sector. And I know that obviously in terms of priorities and commissioning intentions, it's very relevant in terms of how much airtime you're going to have as a representative, a representative of your hospice to be able to discuss some of the issues that you might want to and take things forward. Um, and ultimately, I suppose, the demands and the needs of your population. So there's lots of factors. Um, I suppose when I came into the hospice world from the NHS, I'd had a bit of time in the charity sector beforehand, but what I found about working in the SHA in the performance role was that I'd never been so far away from patients. And the opportunity to work in a hospice is very different because it allows you to do your management, leadership, strategic role, things that I love, but it also enables me to walk through the inpatient unit every day and see patients and families and talk to people and really understand or get a sense of the vision that needs to be developed for an organisation. And before I applied for the job, I started to talk to some senior colleagues within the NHS around me about their perceptions of our hospice. 
And basically, what one of the very senior colleagues within the local community trust said to me, it's just not on our radar. I don't know how it's commissioned, I don't know what it does. You know, it doesn't really mean anything to me. So I went in um, early on thinking that what I need to do is raise the hospice's profile. But I could see clearly that there was a significant programme of change that was needed within the hospice itself at every level. It was very clear to me that I needed to help to work with the board, to support the board, to ensure better engagement and improved understanding of the hospice's contribution to the local health and social care economy, and in order to make sure that they better understood our core business and resulting governance requirements as well. It was also very clear to me that we needed to refresh our vision and start to think about a strategic plan and that's not something you can just walk into an organisation and do overnight. It takes time and it's obviously a very collaborative process. And we're part way through that. We've, we've just written a five-year plan and we're out to consultation on that at the moment. But it's been a very um, shared experience internally. And what I knew about that was that we had to align ourselves to local health and social care priorities. So that was very important. And I think probably most challenging of all, is about developing the internal culture to support the transitions that we would need to make, particularly around things like data capture and why we were doing things in a more business-like way, which is something that I often get challenged about. Um, for me, there were some underpinning principles about developing the relationship with our commissioners, who I knew personally, but being in a different role, um, I think sometimes in Yorkshire you're referred to as an off-cumden or something if you're not from that area and it's a bit like trying to go back into the NHS to work alongside some of those colleagues in a different way was quite challenging actually and to get a seat at the table and to have your voice heard but not being in the role that you might have been in before definitely was a challenge but for me it's about working collaboratively it was about being challenging of ourselves but also the commissioners and ultimately working towards something more transformational. For us, in the last couple of years, we've had a, a lot of development within the hospice, um, certainly internally, but there's some key developments which I think we're really proud of, which are not about me, they're about all of the team coming together, but we had some additional funding to help us to open four beds, four extra beds, so we went from 17 to 21. We negotiated a, a roughly 50% contribution for two years from the CCG for that. And it did get down to having a conversation of putting cards on table and saying, well, look, you know, this is what we're subsidising. What are you going to give us? It's a bit like the conversation that Mark and I had before I started this. Um, you know, you have to remind them what you're doing as well in terms of the services that are being commissioned. We've had extra funding to expand our hospice at home team and to try to look at that community offer. Um, we're really pleased that a bid that was written for a third medical consultant by myself and, and the rest of the team was successful and we've got a third consultant starting in January. That will make a huge difference to the transformation of palliative care and end of life care in North Derbyshire, it's critical. And then this thing about small pots and big impact. I, I mean, one of the things that we, we did was try to secure a longer term um, funding and, and, and again Mark touched on that and we went for a three year um, agreement but it doesn't mean you stop asking so every time non-recurrent funding is available we've said can we have a bit more and I think that you know sometimes you look at non-recurrent funding and think well how can we do that because there are lots of risks associated for us it's almost been a bit like dipping your toe in the water with some things and um, some of the non-recurrent funding we've had has been about services but some of it's been about much smaller um, aspects of work. And so we've had 10,000 for a stairlift project, which our therapists work with. We've got a commitment to fund if we get some other funding we've applied for on a volunteer befriending service. And again, a commitment for some additional money for a welfare benefits role. So there's, there's, there's lots of things I think that you can do to ask for other money and, and we keep asking. Um, an important development for us, and probably the most key development at the stage we're at, is connected to the integrated healthcare agenda locally. I've been asked to project lead the end of life work stream. There are nine work streams identified in North Derbyshire, and end of life is one of those. And that's 
the start for me of getting around the table and having the right conversations with people, agreeing the outcomes that we're going to look at as a whole health community and really starting to move things on. So again, just thinking about when I came in, there was quite a lot of noise in the system about standard contract, service level agreement, all the sorts of different arrangements that hospices have. And I wanted to hold on to our locally agreed SLA. And I wanted to do something which was a bit more collaborative. So um, Anna, my colleague, our Director of Clinical Services and I have met quite frequently with our commissioners to talk about how we could change and develop that SLA. And that's definitely what we've done. And I think one of the things that we've done most successfully is get round the table with them to agree the outcome measures and the targets that would need to be in place um, that we would actually then be measured against. Personally, I don't feel the standard contract fits. And we were lucky that RCCG wanted to carry on working with us in that way. Um, we're certainly able to demonstrate at this stage the return on investment that they're looking for, but I accept that that might continue to develop. I think the other thing to talk about is that um, data is something which for some hospices, you know, you, you perhaps have already been on top of and collecting and has been very meaningful and being shared with your commissioners for a long time. In our organisation, there was some data but we didn't really have anybody who had any particular expertise um, and the data wasn't particularly well developed. So we did bring somebody in who could focus on that and that was definitely a good investment. Um, and what we've got now is a system where we've got a report which is standardised and goes to our uh, clinical commissioners every quarter, but it can also be used for internal mechanisms. So some of it will feed into our internal KPI framework and it gives us that ability to just have a conversation in a different way and to start to show value for money. The other thing is that there was no quality schedule um, and so that was worked uh, collectively or, or rather collaboratively again um, between ourselves and the CCG in terms of what would go in there. So it's a, a mature relationship and it's one where there's a lot of cooperation and I think that's been a great advantage to us actually. What the CCG have said to us is that ultimately they've got to monitor some of the additional investments they've made in a slightly different way. So we have argued the toss a little bit about some of the outcomes that they've insisted in having in place um, to, to monitor things like the hospice at home service and that's about admission avoidance, the extra beds and then to come will be the impact of the third consultant. That probably is the most challenging because I don't quite know how you can measure, measure the impact with, with the, um, I guess, the outcomes that we've agreed. But we've had to meet them halfway. And I think probably what we'll do is we'll continue to steer that as we go forward. Just an example, really, this one, of the sort of data that we produce and the way that we present it. Not really intended to go into any detail here, but we've tried to make it um, interesting to look at, make sure that commissioners are engaged and read it. I think it's fair to say we went a bit overboard and actually we've reined in a little bit what we will be sharing with our commissioners and that was a, um, a point of constructive criticism that they suggested to us quite recently and that's fine. Um, but I think ultimately again it's about, it's about the way we've done things jointly and this enables us to have a really, really good conversation with our commissioners. The other thing is that I think Sending data in on a quarterly basis by email is fine, but you've got to get around the table and make sure that the right narrative is there. And so we always have a front sheet now following our discussions where we're drawing commissioners' attention to the things that we want to talk to them about in terms of our performance. And that's definitely going to be helpful, I think, going forward. Okay. So in terms of our achievements in the last couple of years. I mean, actually, we've had additional non-recurrent funding, which is probably closer to 700,000 when you tot it all up. Um, we are now firmly part of the CCG's um, five-year plan in the sense that they have stated in there that the additional beds that they've commissioned from us or partly commissioned 
will be further commissioned. So our intention was to try to get some non-recurrent funding turned into recurrent funding, and we're starting to see evidence of that happening. They are starting to look to us as experts, in particular in relation to the education role that, that our specialist team have. Um, and also, I think, to, to how far we can go with that in terms of influencing and improving standards in end-of-life care in other settings. I think they do see us as key to admission avoidance, and they also know that what we do is very relevant in terms of the data that they collect around preferred place of death. And ultimately, I think they understand the quality that comes out of the hospice, and that's really, really important, obviously. Final thoughts. Um, I do think that you can manage performance and demonstrate return on investment without a standard NHS contract. And I also think that what commissioners want to see are things that are scalable. And I think quality is scalable. That might sound a bit wishy-washy, but actually there's a lot about quality that you can describe and um, you can show that is very scalable. And I think education is another thing that's very, very scalable. And both those things are at the heart of hospice care. I think the hospice being represented at key decision-making forums is absolutely essential because the biggest change for us in the last two years is the position that we'll now find ourselves in as part of this integrated healthcare agenda and leading the end-of-life project, its influence. It's less about the extra half a million or whatever we've had. It's more about the influence that we can have going forward. And then I guess the final thing is you just, you've got to show your evidence. And if you can do that in a collaborative way, it's much better uh, for the hospice and for the CCG. Lucy, thank you so much. Um, and now on to Kate. So, welcome, ladies and gents. Um, listening to Lucy and Mark this morning, um, it was strangely, uh, felt slightly like deja vu for me, because when I came to my first Health Hospice Conference several years ago, um, I sat listening to presentations like that and thought, oh, if only. <laughs> If only we could even have a conversation with the CCG, let alone reach those kind of dizzying heights. Um, so my presentation today is very much, I want to kind of just roll back a bit for those hospices that are in the room who are thinking, we are nowhere near there yet. And I've made a, a kind of conscious decision to talk about some quite simple techniques of things that we've had to do to build our integration into the local health economy. Um, lots of these you'll already be doing, what you might not necessarily have thought of them as being is your kind of influencing strategy. So how are you working with that outcome data to uh, influence the kind of, what, what are you doing with it? This was a really good question that I was asked by our uh, day therapist team recently when I was talking to them about collecting more outcome data and about us shaping our outcome data in a slightly different way. And they said, well, where do you send it? Who looks at it when we produce it all? Which I thought was a very good question. Um, I came to the hospice from a national charity and um, I, I just very consciously um, in coming to the hospice made a decision about my job title. Now I am also heavily um, influenced by Helen Bevan uh, who has, I'm very lucky to have had as my mentor for the last 10 years and I know that Helen feels very strongly about getting rid of hierarchy. And one of the reasons that I've changed my job title of Chief Experience Officer is executive, what does that mean? And actually my role is to ensure that wherever you touch my hospice and whoever you are, your experience is superb. And so uh, this is a kind of starting to think about a whole different way of influence and shaping the organisation. I've done lots and lots of work on outcome measurement before. I was, as Jonathan said, Director of Strategy at British Red Cross and um, had written the outcome framework for five of the six major um, services that organisation provides. Uh, I've even been to Harvard to learn how to measure the unmeasurable. Uh, so I thought this would be really simple. I just come to the hospice, I just whip up a quick outcomes framework, we'd just whip a few measures against it, and we'd have all this fabulous data, and then the CCGs would be banging on my door to say, Kate, do more, uh, and it just didn't happen like that. What I found was a commissioning environment that was in kind of turmoil. Uh, I have three CCGs in my area that don't necessarily get on. <laughs> 
And there's a bit of an issue about if one does it, the other would think, oh, well, it worked in rich South Warwickshire, it'll never work in poor North Warwickshire, so we, we just can't possibly do that. Um, there was lots of very strong characters in our uh, outside health world, um, uh, very uh, experienced people. Um, we have a lot of system leaders, which is quite an odd concept if you think about it. Lots of people who are setting the agenda, not that many people doing it. Um, and uh, what, what I would say is that our CCGs, um, I kind of have described them as this several times, and, and they know that I've described them as this. But I think the spirit was really willing, but the flesh was a bit weak in them actually knowing how to move forward the agenda. What I also discovered in the terms of our hospice was we were quite insular. We were just not built into the um, networks of the local health economy. You know, we didn't have those touchstones. Um, that meant that as things were happening in the NHS incredibly quickly, you know, changes happening at a rapid, rapid pace, we were not front of mind with healthcare professionals about, you know what, we've got a palliative uh, healthcare problem here. Oh, the hospice, surely they'll know the answer. That just wasn't happening across our patch. We decided about 18 months ago that we just had to stop moaning about that um, and start to think about a new strategy to help shape the world around us and um, take a completely different approach, really. We've been doing some outcome work, and so we were starting to gain some really good data and some information, but just no one was listening to us about it. So this is the average conversation in um, Coventry and Warwickshire, which is I was like out there going to go, well, you know, come and look at the hospice. We're amazing. We do all these fab outcomes, and we achieve brilliant things with patients. And then everyone was saying the same thing. Um, so actually working out how would we get our voice heard, how would we influence what was a big agenda. Um, lots of very positive conversations about end of life care being really important, but what was that turning into? So we did 10 quite specific things and we are working through this at the moment in order to um, influence, build our influence. And so this is a very clear influencing strategy. Um, and as I say, each of these points, I'm sure there'll be stuff that every single hospice in this room is doing. There'll be no huge surprises in this. But pulling it to do it together and doing it absolutely consistently across the whole hospice has just proved really, really powerful for us over the last 18 months. So the first thing I, we did was we spent some time saying exactly what it is that we want to say. What do we want to influence? What, what do we want them to do as a result of talking to them? We've had some key messages that we wanted to get out to healthcare professionals over the period of our last strategy, things like we work in cancer and non-cancer, um, which we would like our referrers to understand. Um, what we realised was even that was too complicated. Um, and so we've gone for just two really simple messages and challenged ourselves over the next three years to ensure every healthcare professional across Coventry and Warwickshire understands just these two things, nothing else. Well, they can understand some of this stuff, that'd be great, but if they just got this, that'd be fine. Um, and just to try and think through um, where are we positioned in the terms of the minds of both our referrers, but our GPs, our commissioners, do they see us as this kind of organisation? The second thing we did is that um, some pretty uh, comprehensive stakeholder mapping, and we're just, we're, we're still in the in the kind of throes of that, we've kind of expanded out from looking at the obvious people, local acute, CCGs, our GPs, our nursing homes, but we've started to kind of widen that out into other organisations, health and social care organisations, other voluntary sector organisations. And we've really tried to think about who knows who and who can influence who, and almost match names to people um, with regards to what we want them to know about us and how will we influence them. So what we've done is we've looked at who already knows who and we've made a decision to dedicate some resource specifically to doing this. And I've met some great people over um, these couple of days who are obviously doing similar jobs in other hospices um, and people have called them kind of community engagement offices and other things. When we made a decision about um, concentrating some resource into this work, this influencing work, we kind of took a step back and we thought, you know, we need someone who's confident, who's really curious, who's quite tenacious. In Helen's words uh, from yesterday morning, we need a no person. Um, 
We know someone who knows Mighton really, really well, who's used to kind of getting knockbacks and a proven track record of influencing people to do things they don't want to do. Mighton, and I will say this, and I don't care, Mighton has one of the best income generating teams in the country. I think they're wonderful. They raise eight and a half million pound. They are superb. And to be honest, uh, the obvious place to look for someone who could really influence our external environment was to our own income generation team and say, who have you got that can get healthcare professionals doing what you can get donors doing? And so we nicked one of Ruth, Ruth's in the audience, she hates me for this, but we nicked one of her senior managers to come and lead what we've called our influencing and developing strategy. Just on as a comment, we haven't got tons of money to chuck at this, and we've brought him in for six months. The next thing we did with our chairman was very consciously look at our board and make um, some quite brave decisions about on that stakeholder mapping, where don't we have influence and who could we bring in, who could we approach, how could we redesign the board to bring those pe people with influence into the hospice. And um, here's my board, all very party-like. Um, but as a result of this, we've um, recruited, for example, the chief nurse for University Hospital Coventry in Warwickshire has joined our board, and surprise, surprise, over the last year, our partnership with them has grown and grown. The chairman has taken it one step further and become the chairman of UHCW, so uh, now our influence is complete, um, but he steps down, sadly, with us in a few months' time. The next thing we did was we had a discussion, and I think uh, some of the other speakers have mentioned it earlier, Lucy and Mark mentioned it earlier. Uh, we were very lucky last year. We had an £800,000 surplus due to legacies, and we've made a conscious decision to invest that surplus into areas of work which will help our influence. So what could we offer that funding as being that would make us an attractive partner um, to uh, some stakeholders? Uh, so certainly things like match funding and sequel funding for projects that they want to get started. We've been looking at some of the single point of access work that Mark talked about, using that funding to say, hey, we would be the obvious person to trial that with because we would be happy to put some funding into that project. Um, so really making a conscious decision about investing reserves in a way that uh, increases and widens our influence. And then we went fishing. And... Um, I think this was probably kind of uh, one of the strangest things that we did. We just made a decision to get out there. We, did, we have done over the last year blanket coverage of nearly all events around our patch that it's useful as being at. We've made sure we've got reps on uh, all the main working groups, however random or boring, you know, and we make them go. Uh, we have produced new materials that promote what we need to say, and we've got those out incredibly widely. And we have just been absolutely um, touting ourselves, uh, soliciting ourselves around uh, the county with our messages about what kind of organisation we are, that we're a problem-solving organisation, that being an independent organisation, we can be fleet of foot, that we're agile, and that we've got loads of flexibility to respond to their needs. Now, this very much feeds into Helen's presentation yesterday morning, because uh, Helen has been doing some work with me around uh, influence at the edge, which she talked about yesterday. And I really, really would recommend, again, to the publication that um, uh, Helen Ann Ross earlier mentioned, but the Edge magazine. One of the things that we looked at was the fact that we can't really drive change in the hospice from the centre. It's just not working. Our biggest connections to that healthcare economy, the way we're knitted into that healthcare economy, are absolutely at the sharp end of what we do. And we've been trying to look at whether some of our staff truly feel that they've got a permissive environment by which they could make decisions for us when there is an opportunity there and then to do something different. And one example I would give you of this is we've had a long conversation with our lead lymphedema nurse. We've talked about what she wants to do with the service, what we want to do with the service. And we've said to her, Karen, we're not going to tell you how to do it. Just go for it. 
If you spot an opportunity to extend this service, if you, your views are requested, she got an email the other day from um, the head of commissioning for South Orange CCG asking whether she could pick up a different sort of patient. And so she was able to respond instantly saying, only if you increase the funding to my service. You know, and just absolutely empower the staff at the edge of our organisation to make changes. And that feels a bit nervous. And those of you that watched Helen's presentation thought, yes, but how do you control it? Uh, that was very much how I felt. I am a control freak. You know, how do you totally let it go so that you really have got staff driving change from the outside? We found lots of um, new routes to the same destination. And um, one of the things that we looked at was uh, some of the things we've done. These are from the absolute macro to the absolute micro. Um, we've looked at who may be a new group of commissioners if we can't influence the CCGs. And we've started commissioning discussions with our acute hospitals directly. I know many of you have done that for a long time. We've started conversations with other voluntary organisations about co-funding arrangements for services. Just, you know, what is it we want to do? What is it we want to achieve? And how can we get there? Uh, one of the things that we did was that we bid for um, a, uh, a program to extend our education agenda to train all GPs and nursing homes in South Warwickshire in palliative care. And uh, the money that they offered didn't quite cover the costs of delivering that program, but we just felt it was too good an opportunity to miss. At the same time, we've been trying to get the CCG to engage in a project that we were even happy to kind of voluntary uh, fund or to pump prime around looking at rapid response support um, for patients because our out of hours service isn't as effective as it could be and how could we, we build that? And the CCG kind of just said, well, it all sounds great, but we haven't got time to engage in the debate. So what we built into the tender was to say, we will deliver this, and here's the costings of it. But the other half of this is that as part of this, we want to use the steering group for this project to oversee the development of this other piece of work we want to do, which uh, they took on board. And, and uh, thank you to Jonathan and um, his team who helped us with some of the work around that tender, which I think um, was, has been very successful. So now we've got a steering group, which includes the end-of-life lead uh, GP commissioner, who are not only debating the project that they funded, but are also having to take an interest in this other piece of work that we're doing. We've done things like we've set up Twitter feeds, um, very specifically around might and futures. So we are tracking all our main healthcare um, providers, colleagues, through a very specific Twitter feed. Uh, one of the things that we were talking about when we were trying to influence GPs was like, well, how do you get in front of a GP? It's just pretty hard, whether you're a patient or certainly if you're an organization. Um, and we were like, where would we find 942 well-educated people that love the hospice that could go out and say to GPs, oh, what do you know about it? So, of course, our amazing volunteers. We have challenged some groups of our volunteers when they have their next GP visit for whatever they're going for at the end of the visit to say, what do you know about the hospice? And uh, it's amazing how many GPs are calling us up saying, lots of my patients are asking about the hospice and I don't know anything about it and you need to come to our next palliative care meeting and talk to us about it because it's embarrassing that I can't respond. Uh, and it's just worked brilliantly, absolutely brilliantly. So these are just ideas where now we've got those two clear messages of what we want to get out. We've been able to engage kind of lots more people in delivering. And these two, many of you have been doing far, far longer than me. So we've strengthened our research function um, so that we have something new to say. Interestingly, when we went out there with our outcome measures, one of the things that came back quite quickly was, you know, Kate, we know the hospice is great, and our outcome work has probably been more valuable for us internally ensuring that we're great as much as it has been to try and influence them. But the things that we're struggling is, what do the patients say? What do the patients want? So what's been quite interesting is we're just commissioning some market research for the new year to look at um, the views of our local population about their confidence of what their end of life experience will be like. So how confident are they feeling that when they come uh, to their own end of life experience or that of a loved one that they will be treated well and that the local health economy will care for them and cope um, with them? And how much of that view is underpinned by knowing that they've got our hospice? And so that we can you know, really go and talk 
to the um, CCGs about what the general population is saying, so much more of a broader uh, a approach to that. And we're doing, uh, we're hoping to commission some academic research next year to look at our um, whether our day hospice plays a bigger role, our day therapy unit has a bigger role in supporting patients to become more resilient and therefore getting their end of life choices and having more control and decision making um, than actually kind of our inpatient unit. Because um, we believe, as many of you I'm surely do, sure do, that it's actually a connection with our day therapy that supports people getting the best end of life care because uh, those that have properly planned, those that feel properly supported, may have a better experience. So again, we can use that evidence along with our outcomes to go back um, almost in a policy type role to our CCGs to persuade them that um, although they kind of look at our, our block grant and say, oh, you know, that day hospice stuff, that's all very nice, but that should be social care. Mm -hmm. And we can kind of go back to them and really challenge that with them. And finally, um, we have not had a particularly strong education function. It hasn't been something that Mighton had invested in previously. And we've made a, a big decision to put significant investment into the development of education. Because I look around lots and lots of hospices that I think are far, far better built into the local economy than Mighton is. And one of the absolutely uh, common themes I found across those hospices is that they have good education programs. So they are regularly seeing those working at the sharp end of palliative care across their patch. And so again, using that as a tool for better influencing. Sorry, this might be a bit small, but just um, some of the things that have come about even over the last year, which may not feel like big things for you, but for us from an environment where we just couldn't really have a conversation with the CCG, we've got a whole range of different things going on. So we've just been commissioned, as I say, for our Good to Great End of Life Care project, um, which is a 220,000 investment, but we're also uh, our local, we're hope, hoping to hear any day now that our local acute is about to purchase six beds from our Coventry hospice. Um, and we're working to look at different models of central coordination, uh, just a whole range of things. We're being funded to put uh, palliative care nurses into both accident and emergency units. So just all sorts of different things going on as a result. So I know for many of you this might feel really, really basic, and um, I'm sure that you are doing a lot of these activities already, but for us, pulling it together into a really coordinated effort has helped us kind of um, really kind of bash down lots of doors and kind of make it so that it, we're hard to ignore, which is our plan. And uh, our general sense is that uh, who knows where it might take us, but at least we've tried. Thank you. Kate, hey, thank you so much. Um, some really helpful pointers, which I'm sure many people would have been scribbling down. But please don't forget that the presentations will be available in the in the conference app in the documents folder. So do do have a look in there if you if you want to extract any particularly particularly useful points. I love the idea of asking your GP what they know about hospice care. I suspect there are many more people in the room who will be doing exactly that <laughs> at the next next um, um, GP contact. Um, I think the one thing that struck me from, from those three presentations is, is really just reinforcing this point that commissioning isn't a process and, a, and, and, and it doesn't operate, doesn't happen in isolation. It is part of that relationship, it's a part of that influence and actually it's got to be a part of the whole organisation strategy. So let's open it up for some, some questions and comments from, from all of you. Um, there should be some raving mics, so do put your hands up. Let's go for one in the middle there. Thanks, Steve. Hi, Mina Viradva from Birmingham St Mary's Hospice. I have to say I found all of those presentations really, really insightful um, and congratulations all of you on the, on the work that you've been doing. Um, what I wanted to know is as you move from your local lovely hospice that knows its place within the landscape to a perhaps more uh, prominent commercial player within those stakeholders in end of life care, how did you manage um, the relationships, one with other um, healthcare organisations that might see you as a competitor or as a threat, um, but crucially uh, your relationships with the acutes because I think 
that's a real challenge, especially in terms of the funding. We know the, the, you know there's not additional money. It needs to come out of the system somewhere. So um, just some pointers on how you manage those, please. Thank you. Let's take, let's take three questions at a time. So, so let's take one from over there. I'm Angela Monaghan, Martin House Children and Young People's Hospice here in Yorkshire. Um, again, echo three fantastic presentations. Thank you very much. Um, I suppose my, it's, I don't know if it's a question you can answer, but the issue that I face as a children's hospice chief exec is that we're dealing with a very large geographical area, a population of around about four million, um, and we've got 16 CCGs in our patch. So I feel, uh, whilst I think what you've done is brilliant, I kind of look at it and I feel slightly overwhelmed and thinking, how do I apply that to our position? So I just wondered if you had any thoughts, particularly, Kate, maybe you working with three, um, about how you work with that multitude of commissioners uh, and, and, and can, can you apply the same principles really or have you got to take a completely different tack? Thank you. Thank you. Um, and one more in this in this group, um, just in the middle here. Uh, Michelle Roberts from the Douglas of Mill. And ju just a question for you, Mark, really. I was very impressed with your presentation. Thank you for that. But I mean, some of the things you talked about, I, I don't have either the capacity or the capability to do. Like, for example, writing a tender waiver paper. No idea how to start on that. How, how do you bring in that kind of capacity and capability? Thank you very much. Let's 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 take some comments from the panel on those. Who's who'd like to start with this question about how you manage the relationship with the with the yeah. um, from, from our point of view, I think there are a number of, of issues which have helped us to manage that relationship. But what I would say, and I, I should have said, is that we're, we're not the polished article. There's a lot to develop still. But one of the ways that um, our relationship works with the acute is that we have four clinical nurse specialists who we employ who are based in the acute hospital. So we've got a presence within that hospital. We don't employ our consultants. They work with us and they spend time in the hospice as part of their role, but one of them in particular has a role in the acute. And so the palliative care function within the acute is about um, the whole population, as is the hospice's contribution. The other thing is that in developing the board, which I mentioned, um, I set about recruiting a trustee from the local acute who was actually quite an influential person because he was leading the cancer build which is developing in that area and there were some threats to us around that but I felt the best thing for us was to try to get them on board and work um, you know, every level with them and the other thing is that the end of life project which we'll be starting will have representation um, from the director of nursing level within the acute and will you know, very much be fostering that relationship and talking about how we can continue to support them with the, with the help that they need around improving end of life care. So it's, a, it's something that had a, a basis already, but I think it needs to be continued to, work, to be worked on. Thanks, Lucy. Um, Kate, do you want to pick up this question about managing complexity? Yeah, I mean, I, I think it is really hard. Um, one of the things um, that I took away from both Helen's presentation yesterday and in previous discussions is about when we've got three CCGs, none of whom really want to work in the same way. Uh, and one of those, Coventry and Rugby, to be totally honest, has kind of almost separated into three separate parts of one CCG. Um, I think there is something about tailoring your offer to where they're at. Um, and for example, if we're ever evidencing something to a CCG, we only ever use the evidence from their CCG I've learnt my lessons about trying to use South Warwickshire data in North Warwickshire. Um, so, so some of those it's just being, I mean these are kind of quite simple things that we've just thought about doing. But the other thing is um, about how much we make it their problem versus ours. So there's some things where we just sit there and think that would be crazy if the hospice was trying to work that way, three completely different ways of delivering the serv same service, hospice at home being a good example of that. Um, it's just not going to work for us. But how much we reflect that back to them, there's a lot of uh, going backwards saying, oh, we took your proposal away, we listened to your outcomes, and we thought this might be a brilliant way of solving your problem, uh, and trying to get them to think that they came up with it. Um, but our, our CCGs are at quite different places as well. None of them were pathfinders, so they're still at a relatively early stage of finding their way. Um, 
which has been in some ways is a positive to that because where there's a vacuum you can fill it. Uh, in some ways they're still working through a lot of those tensions about how they work together so um, I certainly don't envy 16. And particularly a challenge while the system itself is still so fluid and, and changing. And, and, and Mark, maybe on Michelle's question about capacity and capability, which I think is probably a challenge that many people are considering. I mean, if I could just pick up on the complexity point first, because I think that, that then leads in a little bit to the, um, the capacity point. Um, I mean, I think there are a couple of um, options that I would sort of um, identify there. Um, one is to look at um, other providers that have to manage that complexity and ambulance services, albeit offering a different service and, and working at a different scale, regularly have those challenges, um, both operationally and from a commissioning management point of view. So there may be some learning there. and. Um, be a lot of legwork in the first instance, but you may be able to persuade um, uh, those uh, CCGs to adopt a lead commissioner model, and then you could simplify your relationship management that way. Um, the other option, which sort of links into the capacity point, is that um, the Jays Hospice, who we're working with, who are um, uh, sort of focused uh, primarily on sort of uh, young adults uh, living with life-limiting conditions and urological conditions, so sort of slightly niche in terms of um, their proposition and a lot smaller um, than we are, however they provide across the whole of um, Essex, whereas we don't. I think one of the benefits of um, what we're doing working um, with them jointly is that we can actually advocate on their behalf. We're doing a lot of the needs assessment um, uh, within our locality now rather than the, the CCG. Uh, and I think what we would like to see that we're doing is developing a commissioning support function um, that can be useful to other voluntary sector organisations and particularly to other um, hospices. So I think um, another option is to map out um, hospices that are within your geographic area that maybe have relationships that you can piggyback on. Um, in terms of the capacity point, I suppose um, this is my first chief executive role, so I, I didn't really know any better. So when I came in, um, uh, I just chose to prioritise um, external relationships. I mean, good practice, I think, says that um, the sort of management literature says that you should spend a significant proportion of your time uh, outward facing if you're in a sort of um, a leadership role. Um, I came into a very stable organisation with a very secure platform that I was able to um, take advantage of that to actually explore some slightly more risky um, and different propositions. Um, and so therefore, I, I was fortunate really in that um, I was able to come in and from day one probably have continued right the way through. I've spent definitely over half my time outside the organisation and outward looking. Um, and it's sometimes challenging in terms of people's understanding. I think um, sort of, um, uh, Lucy was touching on some of the cultural stuff and when you talk about the business and commercial and commissioning side, that can be a bit of a turn, turn off for some um, hospice staff and I think one of the challenges we found is as much culture as, as it is capacity um, but I, I, I would say it's about prioritising your time where you feel that you're going to get the greatest return in the long run and, and I had a very clear idea that that, that was where I was going to get maximum benefit. Um, to make that sustainable going forward um, we are having to take some risks and I'm very fortunate that I have a very supportive board who understands that we need to rapidly invest in new areas to deliver our purpose, you know, that we can't just think about um, naively focusing on direct clinical care as a means to the end of um, addressing unmet need and growing demand. We've got to have different ways of influencing care and that means investing in business analysts, that means having a business manager um, and it means having some service development resource within the hospice um, and that was quite unusual initially and has been difficult I think for some staff and volunteers to appreciate but my trustees because of that conversation we'd had about purpose about positioning in the economy they were extremely supportive thank you very much um, we are unfortunately all, all out of time for, for, for this session but before we wrap up I just wondered I know Kate you've given us a list of ten um, <laughs> lessons perhaps to learn but I just wonder whether each of our panellists could say what they would what would be your one primary lesson? What would be the thing that you've learned um, that perhaps you hadn't realised before you went into the, all of this? Um, Kate, would you like to start? Seeing as you're thinking of, from a short list of ten, that's probably the easiest position for you. Um, I, I think for me it's... Um, I had higher expectations and thoughts about the NHS not coming from an NHS background. Um, and I thought they would be more coordinated. I thought 
you know, they would be in a stronger position to kind of discuss and debate with me, and that if I took them outcomes data that made common sense, they'd say, yay, okay. Um, and I just underestimated the level of work it takes to actually shift anything or change anything in the terms of NHS colleagues. Um, I think probably for me it was about the fact that the CCG, um, I, I made some assumptions because I knew the people perhaps, um, but what was happening or what is still happening within the CCG is that decision making is held at a very high level and we were having this conversation earlier weren't we so you often end up talking to people who are middle managers who can't actually make decisions and can't shift things as quickly as you want to so you spend a lot of time going backwards and forwards and actually the thing that unlocked the, the money for the extra beds for us was that getting around the table with the director of finance and saying cards on table can you just give us 50 percent you know so sometimes I think it's about that it's about not making assumptions based on what you already know and just probably having to be a bit of a dog with a bone as well uh, I mean I guess for me I've sort of taken a sort of almost a polar opposite approach to um, um, sort of Kate's emphasis and I, I think that, that, that I'll come to a point about what, what I think the, the learning point from that is um, but I very much took the view that um, having an understanding of the local health system, having a view on what I thought was the best outcome in terms of delivery of palliative and end-of-life care, um, I then did exactly what I needed to do to gain control and to make that outcome um, a reality. So I started with an endpoint in mind uh, and we did everything um, in terms of our tactics, our approach, uh, the work that we did to make that happen. Um, but I guess the, um, the key thing, apart from taking control uh, where you can, uh, for me is that actually you've got to adopt your strategy to your local circumstances which comes back to that point about what your relationships are so if you're going to have a relationships based approach to driving and influencing the agenda then you've got to recognize that stakeholders will be different in every area uh, and also when you're talking about relationships you're also talking about people and personalities so I think it's entirely legitimate to have uh, more than one approach to get to the same ends and you need to have an understanding of the people and the stakeholders in your area to do that. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mark, and, and thank you to all of our, our panellists. Thank you to all of you for, for engaging um, and participating in the debate. I would just like to remind you um, um, to look out in your, in your weekly editions of Executive News Online for information, more information on our commissioning support programme, which, which provides not only um, uh, training and guidance and advice um, around commissioning and contracting and some of those sort of technical issues, um, but also sharing of sharing of experiences like we've like we've heard um, this afternoon, um, and signposting to commissioning opportunities, tender opportunities that commissioners will be exploring. Um, so do keep an eye out for that. Or if you'd like to know a bit more, just catch one of the, any one of the Hospice UK team. We're very happy to help. But in the meantime, can we just thank our panelists um, for their contributions?